Hello everyone, welcome to the second season of Humanity Ki Chain. 10 September is marked as the Suicide Awareness Day. And the guest joining us today is a mental health warrior. She tried to take away her life, but afterwards she devoted herself conquering the mental illness and helping others suffering from depression. As Texas-based newspaper columnist, freelance environmental journalist, and a professional speaker. She has recently published her book named You Aren't Depression's Victim. So let's hear from Deborah herself. Welcome, Deborah. Hi, thank you very much. So we would like to know more about the work you do in this space. Um, as far as professionally, uh, I've been a writer for I, too long, <laughs> 2008, however many years that is, it's a lot of years. And um, I started as a uh, newspaper columnist and then started writing features and have written for uh, regional and national magazines and a lot online as well. Uh, my focus primarily had been uh, environmentally environmentally focused, as well as green innovation, which I'm very interested in. Uh, and then I branched out. I have a lot of interests, so I tend to write about the things that I'm really interested in. Uh, conservation, wildlife conservation, um, animal rights, uh, but also environmental journalism is very, very dear to my heart, important. Okay, that's so nice to hear from you. So uh, Deborah, we would like to know that uh, what all work you do in this mental health sphere? Ah, I love that you call health warrior. I never thought of that. I really like that. Thank you. Um, I wrote, wrote this book. Uh, it just came out uh, two weeks ago uh, yesterday. And it was, um, I won't say it's a labor of love because it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, and it was, will tell you, and writers will tell you, they don't write necessarily because they want to, they write because they have to. And this book pushed at me for a very long time. Um, I thought it was just gonna be journaling and I'm not, a, not journalist for myself, I don't journal. Uh, and over time, I kept seeing there's more and there's more. And eventually I realized there was so much material that it was supposed to be a book. Mm -hmm. and that's how the book came about, but it was um, a 13 year process, uh, but not all of it concentratedly. You know, it was a very tough subject and sometimes I would write for a month or two and then I'd have to go away for a few months. And uh, um, sometimes it was longer than that. And then I would just dive in. So it was an amazing process. Okay, so based on your experience- But I didn't- Yeah, I just wanted to ask you that since you have written this book and I have read the excerpt of the book, it is really very interesting. And I would like to know that based on your experience, how do we identify that, uh, uh, I mean, before depression hits, how do we identify that we are on the edge of getting into that zone? That's an important thing. First of all, people need to know that they can identify it. Most people think that, that live with depression and I, I live with depression probably since age two. That's a long time. And um, when you are in the middle of depression, you just, you're on automatic. You, you can't see anything. It's like this dark tunnel. But it's important to recognize that you can find the edge. And some of the, uh, there, there is an edge. Um, and some things to notice are what happens that triggers you? what actually happens. We have our view or our perspective of what happens, but what actually happens? You know, it might be somebody says something that sounds mean or 
uh, somebody accuses you some, of something that you did or didn't do, those kinds of things. But it's important to pay attention and notice triggers you because the, the saying is you can't change anything until you know where you are and where you've been. So identifying those things. And one other thing I, I started paying attention to was my self-talk. Now, self-talk is what we say to ourselves about ourselves. And usually for people with depression, it's incredibly negative. And that can so throw you down into that depression pit. But we don't not often notice how that voice is chattering in our head and what it's saying. We just kind of go with it. So oh, what is your self talk? Because when you can start to identify these things, the what happens and the what you're thinking about yourself, you can begin to see that there just might be a choice that you can make that isn't about going on automatic falling into the pit. And that may people. How do you identify the edge? You pay attention. You start to notice what you're doing. For example, I noticed over the years that when I was deep into prima floor and curl up. Now I have a dog, so I'd curl up with my dog. But I'd be on the floor. And one day I went, what am I doing? What am I doing? And I got up. I shifted the energy. And it was amazing because suddenly, you know, and I shifted my posture. And I suddenly noticed I felt just a little bit better. So again, it's paying attention to what's happening. The more you can do that, the more you can begin to see that there, there's a different choice you can make other than automatically falling into that pit. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Paying attention, noticing the patterns absolutely makes a huge change. So uh, while in the process of writing your book, is it based on your personal experiences or over the years you have experienced something? What is this book about? <laughs> All of that and more. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to say that this book is, I hope, something very different because it's about empowering people who live with depression. It's not only giving information. It's about empowering them so that by the end of the book, they have some tools, some strategies that will help them, what I call stand up to depression, mm -hmm. to not, not fall into the pit the next time something happens. And to realize that you don't have to constantly be redoing the past. You don't have to constantly be reliving, well, if X happens, that means I do Y. Uh-uh, not with this book. That's why I called it you aren't depression's victim. Yeah. If you can pay attention and notice and make some small changes, then you can stop or at least slow down and sidestep. Yes. And, and I feel it's an ongoing process, right? It's not just a one-time thing to do. It's, I think for... For a lot of people, it will be brand new. I know that for myself, um, I, when I was deep in depression, and I, I, I found this is true for a lot of people, I would go in what I call hibernate. I'd go yeah, in really my house or my that. apartment. I'd close the door. I would lock the door. I would not, I would not return phone calls. I would not answer the door. <laughs> I would... And I would not be in communication with people sometimes for days, sometimes in the old days for weeks. I couldn't. I couldn't communicate. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't explain what was going on. I, for a lot of the time, I didn't even know that's what depression was. I had no distinction between depression and the blues. That came much later. I was actually stunned when my therapist talked about what the blues were. I was mm -hmm. like, what are you talking about? 
Yeah. <laughs> what? That's a different language. I don't understand that word. So I had to get that distinction. And for a lot of people, I think that's true. We, we don't have those distinctions. No. And it's important to be able to recognize there are those distinctions. Now, yeah. people that aren't, don't deal with depression don't understand a lot about what depression is versus when they feel sad. It exactly. ain't the same. Right. And that's where we need awareness and conversations like this, the more and more conversations, right? Yeah. Yes. You know, I, throughout the book, I ask questions. Yeah. I ask people to engage in ideas that maybe they haven't thought of before. Mm -hmm. And the answers that they come up are not only revealing for themselves, but begin to allow them to see new possibilities. And that's my job in life, to really point out possibilities that people hadn't noticed. That's what the book's about. Yeah, that's really nice. Okay, uh, since you have been working in this for a long time, you have written a book and you yourself have been through a lot. So I would like to know if you can share something, some workable thing to people who are already dealing with depression or who like, you know, yeah. who can just step back from the edge or if they can do something about their life. Few tips or a few things out of your personal experiences if you can share with our audience. So what, what can people do is what you're asking? Yes. Talk in the book about there's no one thing that works for absolutely everybody. You know, somebody asked me not long ago, well, do you recommend medication? Somebody else says, do you re recommend therapy? There's many things that work and not one thing works for everyone. Yeah. I tell people, you need to find what works for you first of all. You need to try things. If you all end up, probably not. Do people need somebody else to talk to? Uh-huh. Should it be the best friend? Usually not. Yeah. <laughs> it requires being able to reach out to someone who is skilled in what I call holding the bigger picture. Because when you're in depression, you ain't got the bigger picture. Yeah. It's like this. Right. You need someone to say, uh, excuse me, there's all this over here. You may not have remembered it's there. And to keep pointing to that and to keep guiding you so that you be begin to see that. That's a process. Um, and then explore the new ideas, explore new things. You know, I am on a couple of uh, depression support boards on Facebook and there's a lot of pain out there and a lot of hopelessness and helpless. And I'm here to say it's not hopeless, it's not helpless, but it requires some effort to begin to step out of that, yes, but it's it. doable. It's yeah. very how do I know? Because I'm still here. So, um, you know, depression was, I lived with it for so long, it's all I knew. And as I gained more distinctions, I began to see that maybe I could be the master of my life. What a new thought that was. And then I gained tools and, and, and ideas and things that I could engage engage in. That's the thing. When you begin, when you get to see that you want to step out of this, out of the depression, then there are steps to take. Um, you know, again, recognizing that you can. Yes. You know, for some people, they may fight the idea that they, they actually could step out of depression because it's a comfortable place. You're familiar yes. with it. And yet you're not stuck with it. And that's important to know. You're not stuck with it. You know, it, it, just because yesterday was yesterday doesn't mean today has to be the exact same reflection. It doesn't. It's a new day, new possibilities. So for me, it doesn't mean that I don't sometimes get right at the edge. I do. When COVID hit, the first six months almost, yeah. I couldn't write. There was so much chaos, so much upset, and so much isolation 
information and so much uncertainty and fear going on. I got stuck just like everybody else. And then one day I said, that's enough. That's enough. I'm not doing that. And I was, I had been right at the edge and I hadn't been at the edge for a long time. I'm like that. And I said, enough now, let's back away. I know the things I need to do for me. You know, I was lying on the couch a lot. We all did. We all did. (laughs) What else was there to do? So I got up and I started doing things. Yeah, you know, I I doubled my garden. (laughs) Need to, we need to do that. It caught me outdoors, you know. Uh, (laughs) Later I went, what was I thinking? But, you know, um, but I got engaged in things. Mm -hmm. I danced around my house. That I discovered when you're dancing, cannot be depressed. It's literally physically impossible yeah so when i get towards the edge i for me that works i dan- I put on some music tell my dog let's go dance and he thinks it's a time to play and i i know it's time to put time to dance and we both have a good time so discover what works for what you works to for step you. back exactly, exactly. because things there are things that you, everybody can find yeah. yeah and i outline a lot of that in my book you aren't depression's very Victim. The title is very specific for a reason. I was felt very much a victim for decades. So you don't have to be. You just don't. Thank you so much. And I really loved how you explained it. And I totally agree with you that uh, what might work for me might not work for you. But we have to keep trying and keep searching for that one thing which can help us, right? So... Thank you so much for sharing all the valuable yes. insights and, and to and to and to recognize and commit to hmm. that it's possible for you to not be a victim. That's a big step. It's a huge step. <laughs> but again, a doable one. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. It is. You know, I, I tell people, start with small steps. Start with small yeah, steps and take another step. step and then take one another step. step. Yeah. 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 For me, the first one was getting off the floor and put on some music and dance. That's an easy one. Easy one. Right. <laughs> okay. Fine, then. I think... Uh... I won't take much of your time now. So thank you so much for sharing everything, what all I asked you. And I'm going to share the description of Deborah's book in the link, uh, link in the description below. So you can go and check that out. You can get in touch with Deborah. I'll share her email ID with you all. And thank you once again for joining us for this initiative of mine, which is Humanity Key Chain. Thank you everyone for watching. Thank you very, very much for having me. My pleasure.